Scripture for the message is Luke 9, verses 49 through 62. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, because he does not follow with us. Jesus said to him, Do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. Now when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. Now when the disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? And he turned and rebuked them. And they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have hoes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and announce the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Follow me, Jesus still calls to us today. But how do we know if we're truly following him? The answer isn't just coming to church and occasionally doing some kind of good action. Some people over the years I've seen consider uh, church as a social club that we have formed. And yet Jesus said in uh, John 15, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And so even though sometimes in our own minds we say to ourselves, well, I'm getting myself up and I'm going to to church in the morning, uh, spiritually something different is happening. Jesus calls us, we didn't call him, and so he's the one that leads us to come together. There's something deeper that occurs when we come to church than just what we can consciously think about at the moment. When Jesus walked on this earth, he asked the Heavenly Father to work through everything he did. And so when that same Jesus calls us today to come to church and gathers us together, we, like him, are called to turn to him and ask him to work through our lives, that everything we do would be led by him. If we indeed follow him in that way, characteristics of his earthly life will start to shine through our lives. And that's what it will mean to truly follow him. That's what our text lifts up for us as we have some unusual uh, uh, verses here. There's two instances of the disciples following him physically, but not spiritually to start with. The first one, uh, the disciple of John, sees someone casting out demons in Jesus' name, but he forbade him because he wasn't physically following along with him. And Jesus said that was wrong. He who is not against you is for you. So you don't have to look at the physical following. Jesus seems to be saying to him, you should look at his heart. Is he following me in his heart? And if he is, don't try to stop him. The second incident, so still uh, with John as well and his brother James, a Samaritan town has refused to receive Jesus because he was heading for Jerusalem. And they thought you shouldn't worship in Jerusalem, but on Mount Gerizim, which was a mountain in Samaria. And so James and John, they want to ask God for fire to come down and to destroy that town. Jesus rebukes them. In another gospel, he says, you do not know what kind of spirit you are. And of course, the spirit they're asking to be here is a spirit of condemnation. A spirit that simply says they are to blame and they deserve to die because they didn't receive you. But contrast that with Jesus' own example. It had said right before that in the verse,
first that, that Jesus set his face to go unto Jerusalem because the days of his being taken up had drawn near. The days of his being taken up means of when he's going to die. So because the days of his death were approaching, it says Jesus set his face, and so there's a certain determination and purpose that goes on there, that he's setting his face to go to Jerusalem. And here we're only at the end of Luke chapter 9, and there's 24 chapters in total, but already early in the gospel, he's set himself and determined himself that he's going to march on to this death. Not because he likes dying in and of himself, but because of what that death's going to do. That death's going to make us children of God. And so he has this determination. It's a giving of himself sacrificially for the sake of others. And then think about how bad it was where James and John, they want to condemn others and blame others when they see something wrong. Jesus saw something wrong happening every day all around him. But instead of condemning and blaming others, he just determined even more that he would die on their behalf in order to change them from the inside out to become children of God. Now that behavior of Jesus also contrasts with what is often called the three would-be followers of Jesus. The first one comes up to him as they're on the road still, and he says, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, well, various animals may have their homes and nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So it seems that Jesus knows in this person's heart that they're saying with their words, I will follow you, but they don't really know what that means. Maybe they think it's the right thing to do, or they're supporting a good cause by following Jesus. But they don't really understand, like in the call to worship, to take up their cross, deny themselves, and follow me. That there's something bigger going on here, and this person, when they're told, son of man has nowhere to rest and lay his head, they leave. And so they don't follow him. They weren't ready to really give of themselves as Jesus gives. The second man said he would follow Jesus if he could first go and bury his father. And Jesus says, leave the dead to bury their own dead. Instead, you announce the kingdom of God. Now that sounds very harsh at first, but again, Jesus knows this particular person's heart. And so he knows that when this person says he's ready to follow Jesus, what he's doing is he's trying to place Jesus into his own life. His own life that already has various priorities. And right now the top priority is burying his father, and following Jesus is the second priority. So it's up high in his, in his mind at least. But Jesus knows with that kind of an attitude when instead of giving our lives to Jesus, we expect to put Jesus into a little part of our own, that there's always going to be other priorities come up. And down the line, even if he had buried his father, Jesus, uh, following Jesus would become not just second, but maybe third, fourth, or even later on his list of priorities. Contrast that with Jesus setting his face for the sake of us to march to his death at Jerusalem. There was a priority of this sacrificial giving of himself. It was the top priority and nothing could take its place. The third man says that I will follow you, but first let me, let, uh, permit me to say farewell to those in my house. And Jesus answered, no one putting his hand on the plow and looking back is well fit for the kingdom of God. Again, Jesus knew his heart, and so this man, if he was going to follow Jesus, he would always be burdened with thinking about what he had to leave behind in order to follow Jesus, what he had lost. And yet, that amounts to not really following him. He might have physically followed him, but he wouldn't be following him in his heart. Because followers in their hearts, 
don't look back at what they've lost. They gain something with following Jesus and they look ahead to what they can give sacrificially, just as he gave sacrificially. They're always looking ahead instead of looking behind and mourning. So this man would have never been a true follower in his heart to always be thinking about what he was leaving behind. Jesus is showing in all of these what true following is really all about. Just like with his own life, it was a giving of himself so that his heavenly Father can work through him. And when the Father worked through him, the love of God shone through Jesus' actions. In that same way, we're called to follow Jesus today, to know that it's still a sacrificial giving of ourselves. So God's love can shine through even our actions. Let's hear how a man named Eli Glick, uh, he had a very dramatic episode in his life and it reminded him what true following was. And it wasn't that he wasn't following Jesus, his wife, uh, Verda, and he had been missionaries in El Salvador, El Salvador for 26 years. Their five children were born there. And a loving congregation, and they even did outreach. For example, one evening, a van load of 20 of them had gone up into the mountains to hold weekly services by a kerosene land for more of the tribal regions. As they were returning down the road, though, Eli suddenly found himself called to a different kind of outreach. There were some log, uh, large logs that were in the road on the way down the mountain. So he and one of the young men got out and started to move them. Three men in camouflage came out of the bushes and had guns. Everybody out, they said. They led them into the forest. One of the women started crying, God protect us, Eli prayed out loud. Shut up, the man said, and he showed him a grenade. We could kill all of you right now. They took any money they found on any of the 20. They took watches. They found out that Eli was a pastor. They tied his hands and they led him away. And they let the other 19 go, but only by saying, we want 100,000 colones by 2 p.m. tomorrow or he dies. So they led him further away into the wilderness. For a while he said he was tied to a tree. His hands were, arms were stretched back and they tied it so he had a tree around him that he was uh, staying at. But then they went on a little further. They put him in a small rectangular kind of box made up of stones. They put an old t-shirt over his head. They had uh, his ankles tied together and his hands were tied to his belt in the front. Climb in and lie down. And then they put branches over the top so that he couldn't be uh, seen or spotted probably from the air. The stones, he said, were jabbing him no matter which way he uh, shifted positions. And the heat was stifling in this little rectangular enclosure. Eventually morning came and he said that saliva was the only thing that he was given to drink. He heard some talking and it sounded like two of the men were going to go off to some place where they were going to see if the ransom money was going to come and that one man would stay there. The footsteps approached him. Do you think they will come up with the money? They'll try, Eli answered. And then he asked for some food. I haven't eaten either, so shut up. Suddenly, he said, the words of Jesus came to me. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who despitefully use you. This seemed too much for me, he thought. But as he was there a few minutes and continued to think, he thought, but it's what Jesus was calling him to do, to follow him. So he said out loud, God bless you. There was no response. But somehow Eli felt a certain sense of uh, fear subsiding within him that he was doing something God wanted him to do. 
ants began coming out from the ground and, and off of those branches that were over the top of him, and they began crawling all over him and biting him. He couldn't hardly stand it. He asked his captor to uh, get them off of him. Shut up, hold still. God bless you, Eli said. God loves you, and I do too. I'm praying for you. Quiet, no more talking. After a couple of hours, Eli's legs were cramping, but he wasn't allowed to sit up. God bless you, he said. I tried to focus not on my pain, but on my prayer. Lord, help this young man find new life in you. Around noon, the captor uh, relinquished and allowed Eli to sit up for 20 minutes. He told the man to look into his pocket and there would be a small New Testament there that he could read. He heard the man leaf through the pages and he was praying silently that the man would be able to find some right things in that New Testament for his eyes to, to stop upon. The 20 minutes were over though and he told him to lay back down. You're a good man who helps people. Even if no ransom is delivered, I will release you in two. So Eli said he both felt exhilarated on hearing this and yet he was still in pain from being in this cramped enclosure. An hour and a half later, the man told him to sit up, he untied him, he said, stand, just don't look at me. Then he handed him two oranges and ten colonists for bus fare, and he pointed him in the right direction to where the road was, but said, just don't look back. Eli was able to make it home by 4.30 that afternoon. Two weeks later, his kidnappers were captured by the authorities. Eli said, I visited them in the penitentiary, taking them food and clothing. I will do anything I can to help them find an abiding faith. The faith that I experienced when Jesus led me to bless those who cursed me and to pray for those who despitefully used me. Jesus still calls us today, follow me. May we not just think like those would-be followers that we're just putting Jesus into a small place in our life, but may we give our lives sacrificially to him and for him so that Jesus' love can work through us and then our actions can announce to others the kingdom of God. A kingdom where even all of those others can become children of God. So may we be true followers of the Jesus who first gave himself for each and every one of us.